Welcome back to our Teach Out on Concussion. Joining me is Joanne Gerstner, a sports journalist in residence at Michigan State University. Joanne, thanks for joining us today. Absolutely, thank you. Maybe orient our viewers uh, to your experience in sports journalism and how you got into your current role at Michigan State. Yeah, absolutely. I've been really lucky to have a long career in sports journalism. I started out as probably a lot of people did in the 90s, wanting to go into traditional print. And as the world has changed, my career has changed too. So. I've been lucky enough to work at the Detroit News and USA Today and ESPN and you know some magazines and online. And one thing was common through through all those things from covering the NBA or the Olympics, you know, athletes were getting hurt. And the discussion that we are able to have as sports journalists, especially about things like concussions, are not as nuanced as they need to be. So I decided about 10 years ago now to really try to start to educate myself. And it was hard because, as you know, the information was not all together, it was not consistent, and I don't have a neurology background, obviously mm -hmm. I have my degrees in journalism, so delving mm -hmm. into a very complex world of nuanced medical information was challenging, but I think I made a little bit of progress. Yeah, you certainly have a, a fantastic reputation uh, amongst my colleagues and some of the work that you've done, so. Thank you. Um, so um, you mentioned you started, uh, you know, ten plus years ago, um, and, and media certainly changed since that time. Yes. I think I think back, um, you know, as as a, a young adult uh, opening the newspaper, um, and that just doesn't really <laughs> exist today. So, yeah. can you maybe talk about how um, how the change in media, shifting from traditional print or news into more social media driven, how that's changed the conversation? Every conversation has changed. You know, it doesn't matter if it's health or politics. We are now fast, 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 fast. So we went from maybe someone taking 20 minutes to read a story in the Sunday New York Times to then I just want to see the highlights on mm -hmm. TV. Just show me the dunk, show me the home run, to now give me the tweet, give me the snap story. And the problem is a lot of the subjects in our world are not that crystal clear. I mean, it's very hard to articulate a political policy in, you know, 100 and 40 characters or whatever, much less talking about concussion, much less talking about the individuality of injuries. And then the next level of it is we now have an entire generation that has grown up without a newspaper landing on their doorstep. So the whole way they consume information is very visual. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with how people consume it. But the question for people like me is, how do I best deliver the information that's accurate, timely, but also has the nuance and the depth to help educate my audience? And that's kind of where we have problems connecting within the media to our public. Certainly, and uh, so I see that uh, as well with um, amongst my students and my daughter, for that matter, um, where it's, uh, it's, it's rapid information. So along those lines, we certainly, after we've seen this shift, um, you know, the question that comes to my mind is what is media? So something uh, like a long piece in the New York Times, uh, even an in-depth report on CNN, I think most people would classify as media, but then we get into more nuanced, uh, maybe something on Snapchat or Twitter mm -hmm. uh, that may not come from somebody with the same background that you have or uh, even a medical or professional yeah. may have. So can you maybe uh, walk our viewers through um, kind of where that line is um, and really maybe how to uh, understand um, what is, is qu high quality information versus something they should maybe dig into a little bit deeper? Well, we've, obviously when Mark Zuckerberg and his pals were sitting in their dorm room at Harvard, they never envisioned where this was all gonna go. So Facebook and the ability for you, meaning the public, anyone, to be the sharer of information has radically changed the quality of the information. And a, a great example would be how you can still see it, I still see it on my Facebook page probably once a week, someone will share, hey, there's this new article about how uh, autism is caused by vaccines. Even though we have utterly scientifically, me, we, meaning the world, debunked that, someone still finds an article from somewhere, shares it, and said, well, this has gotta be real. I saw it with my own eyes. And I do an experiment in my class to kind of shake my students up, and it's very effective. I take them to a Wikipedia page, and they don't realize you can change a Wikipedia page, anyone can. So I literally go in there and tell them, I want you to write something up based on what you've seen give them about 15 minutes, I go back in and I start changing the information. And they don't realize that that can be that malleable. So people, when they see evidence, we are still very visually based. And yet we're more skeptical than ever. And the problem is we now have this new alignment of I only believe information coming from sources that align with what I already think. We're not doing a great job allowing people to have open minds about things. And that's kind of what's happening with the concussion world is that a lot of people in the public have made up their minds based on things that they've in 
digested from different media outlets. <laughs> and here's the thing, I could go on Twitter right now and give myself a handle of Dr. Joe Blow, and there's nothing Twitter would do to contest me giving myself a false title. So that's a problem. So right. my best idea right. for people is to trust then verify. If you see something that looks interesting, go and Google it, see where it came from. You can usually find it in a few clicks. Does it take more effort? Yes, but is it worth it? Absolutely. So along those lines, I think um, a lot of people have this perception of, um, I had a concussion playing high school sports or my child had a concussion playing high school sports, therefore they are destined to some sort of long-term chronic impairment. Yeah. Um, and certainly, you know, even as a researcher, um, you know, this is something we're highly interested in and something we're evaluated, but the science is far from resolved on this topic. Right. Um, so maybe talk about uh, maybe how the media has influenced that conversation uh, and, you know, or, or has the media overstepped their bounds? Do they need to dial it back a little bit? That's a really interesting question. I wrestle with that every day. And I think there's a few things going on. Number one, we have turned into a society where we can get information like that. I can press a button on Siri and Siri can give me answers to questions. Mm -hmm. I can go on Google and get answers at my fingertips. So when someone like you or me comes back and says, hey, concussion is one si not one size fits all. Mm -hmm. And uh, like you've heard many times, when you've seen one concussion, you've seen one concussion. So that doesn't jive with, well, why can't you give me an answer? You can tell me if I have cancer, you can tell me if my arm's broken, you can tell me if I'm pregnant. Why is there this gap? So there's skepticism. Then the media jumps in with, well, um, we want to be proactive in this. Isn't this terrible? Isn't this awful? All these amazing athletes are losing their lives and their careers. It's a compelling narrative. And unfortunately, because of the gap of medical knowledge and not having that hammer to say, no, you're right, or yes, you're wrong, people can dance in that kind of that weird light. And a lot of the people that are screaming the loudest in the crowded theater also have a vested interest to do so. They either have a financial gain from it or they get themselves known um, you know, for ad as being an advocate. And look, you and I are both on the same team in this and that we want everyone to be safe. We want kids to play sports, we want adults to play sports. We Health and safety come first, absolutely. But we both know people that have had multiple concussions and have had productive careers. We also know people that have had one concussion and it was of a severity with uh, post-concussive uh, syndromes that it was in their best interest to leave that sport. So the truth not being neat allows people to get in there and do mayhem. And at some point, people are like, I don't know what to believe anymore. So I'm gonna believe what I decide to believe that aligns with kind of where I was from the start. And that both is people that say, hey, everyone's a snowflake, there's no such thing as concussions, to I'm never allowing my child to play sports because it's all too dangerous. We have those polarizations going on. Sure, and do you also think along those lines that um, there's an inherent bias of uh, you know, I can find one, I can always find one person that has a bad outcome from anything. Right. Uh, and if I highlight that person or if a media piece highlights that person, then the belief then is that, well, everybody that has this problem now will have this outcome. Oh, absolutely. And if you think about it, if you take to say your average, and I'll use football or women's basketball, whatever you want, there might be five people that have a concussion. Four of them might heal perfectly within the normal span, go back and their lives are good, but the one person who's not is the anomaly and therefore is a more compelling story. Also the movie Concussion, we have to be real, uh, that came out a couple of years ago. Um, you know, it was a fantastic fiction narrative. And it really, a lot of people didn't understand that some of the things in there were, you know, liberties were taken with them. And the other problem is too, is that we don't like to accept that we don't know everything already. And, you know, and, and, and the brutal part that I've discovered through my research is there are many well-meaning clinicians from pediatricians to ER docs. They tell these people when they come in for evaluation some pretty scary stuff, mm -hmm. which is their job to rule stuff out, but they're also adding to, well, this sounds really scary, therefore I shouldn't do it. So it's, it's a multifaceted problem, and that's why I think it's so important to discuss it and have people understand the basic terminology and what they need to know if something happens so they can see a clinician and have a good discussion. So in your view, what is the best way to um, re-engage the public on a more, um, I guess, a, a less um, catastrophic view of, of the injury? I just, at the youth level, which I've focused a lot of my efforts on, it's just a lot of parents, coaches, and yeah, I'm talking about high school kids, they don't get a chance to ask questions before they're hurt. So it's like, it'd be so much more productive if high schools had sessions that weren't scary 
and they weren't, you know, kind of reminds me of like the drunk driving, scared straight things they used to do when they bring the wrecked car. That's how they approach concussions. Like it's all gloom and doom. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of these parents that I've talked to, they don't realize the difference between concussion and PCS. They don't realize if you had ADHD or migraines or something going on before that afterwards it might be a little bit worse, if not mm -hmm. in a different tangent. And also they don't realize the neck involvement of, and so there's so many things like, well, it's my head. And what really makes me sad is there's a lot of amazing coaches, amazing parents and players that literally when this happens, the resources they thought they have are really not there. And they go to the emergency room, you're fine, go home, go rest. I'm still hearing people that say, hey, you should go sit in a dark room mm -hmm. for a month. Well, we all know, and that's proven by the literature and the research, that's like the worst thing you can do. Right. But they're still being told to do that. So we need to kind of clear mm -hmm. out the cobwebs and start the discussion in a safe space before you get hurt. And the whole thing is you mm. may never get hurt. You might hurt. tear your ACL, you might do something else. Right. So we need to make a concussion an injury that needs to be treated and discussed with intelligence and not just fear. Right. So earlier this year, you were named um, commissioner on the Women's Task Force in Sport by Gretchen Whitmer. Mm -hmm. um, so talk a little bit about um, that position and maybe what you hope to accomplish um, in general or maybe more specifically around concussion? Yeah, it was a fantastic honor. I was really surprised because the people that are on this commission are women that are athletic directors and have won Olympic medals or Carol Hutchins, who's like one of the biggest legends in the world <laughs> for coaching uh, here at Michigan. Uh, I'm the only media person on there, mm -hmm. but I think what we're all trying to do and what we're all charged with doing is a few levels. Number one, the anniversary of Title IX is coming up, mm -hmm. the 50th anniversary in 2022. So our task force is a three-year span, and what we want to do is look at what opportunities and, and obstacles do women and girls in the state of Michigan face from sports. So youth sports, is it clubs, is it availability, is it coaching? Um, injuries and then high schools you have you know schools offering the same type of you know opportunities are there other things schools should be looking at and then obviously professional and college but also how do we have women transition into say front offices um, we only have one woman in the state who's an athletic director of a major university so uh, there's still not that many women moving up the ranks so we're all coming from our different places to kind of see we're gonna send mm -hmm. a survey out soon mm -hmm. to all the coaches and everyone involved from all levels to talk about this. And our hope is that we're gonna propose ideas, possibly legislation, uh, maybe inducements, economic inducements that the governor, obviously not me, but the governor can <laughs> offer to maybe get a pro team back in the state. You know, right. we don't have an WNBA team anymore. We don't have, you know, pro tennis tournaments. And we have one LG, I think we have one LPGA, but there's mm -hmm. so many more things that could be here. And with the big three and all of our deep economic roots, we wanna do that, but it's, a really deep honor to sit in that room and these women are brilliant and they're passionate and especially for me as someone who grew up after title nine i've never known a world where i couldn't be an athlete i played mm -hmm. tennis in college um listening to these women of what their lives were and how they had to fight just to get to play basketball half court wearing a skirt it, it turns my stomach and so i really want to hopefully have michigan be a leader in this and we are the first task force in the nation so hopefully others will follow our lead mm -hmm. And yeah, and I just, I'm just honored to be in the room. It's kind of Hamilton. I'm in the room where it happens, so I'm kind of happy about it. So. Excellent, excellent. Joanne, thanks for joining us today. We appreciate your insight on this important topic. Thank you so much. I appreciate you doing this.